Good morning and welcome to the Pollinator Projects webinar. My name is Sarah Schumacher and I'm the Agricultural Conservation Coordinator and ALF Coordinator at Wheatland County. Our partners today include uh, Wheatland County, Rocky View County, Foothills Forage and Grazing Association, and the Agroforestry and Woodlot Extension Society, otherwise known as Oz. <laughs> Um, to reduce uh, disruptions during the presentations, your camera and microphone have been disabled. Uh, we ask that you type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of each presentation. If you have any technical issues, please post those in the chat and someone will try to assist you. Also, the presentation will be recorded and will be posted on the foothillsforage.ca website by tomorrow if you want to view any part of the presentation again. Okay, so um, Lou Kwanick, um, who works at Oz, will be presenting on the habitat requirements of pollinators, protecting and planting pollinator habitat, and the benefits of protecting and establishing pollinator habitat. Luke has worked as an agroforestry specialist with the Agroforestry and Woodlot Extension Society for the past five years. He is passionate about helping farmers find ways to integrate biodiversity into their operations. For breakfast, he enjoys eating caragana pancakes with Manitoba maple syrup. Luke has um, a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Calgary and a master's in environmental policy from Oxford, University of Oxford, and is currently working on a PhD in sociology at the University of Alberta. So I'll hand it over to Luke. Super, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and um, thank you for, to, for Wheatland County and for the Foothills uh, Forage and Grazing Association for um, yeah, having us all together here. I'm really excited to be uh, presenting here with uh, uh, Grant, who you'll hear about uh, hear from uh, later on. Uh, um, <clears throat> I will uh, uh, just share my screen here. Let's see how this goes. Okay, and I will. Okay, you can uh, see me in this presentation. Okay, I can't really see you, but it looks yeah. good, Luke. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And also thank you. Thank you all uh, participants for, for coming out uh, here today. Um, yeah. And it's great. To, we have a, a pretty, a pretty big crowd here uh, learning about uh, how to protect and uh, work with pollinators in the landscape. Um, yeah. So I'm going to be presenting here for the first, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. We'll see how long I talk. And then um, uh, we'll have a chance for uh, Q and A. And um, somewhere in there, uh, Sarah will do her presentation, perhaps, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on to Grant's presentation. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Luke Wanick, and as mentioned, uh, um, I'm working as an agroforestry specialist here with the uh, Agroforestry and Woodlot Extension Society, or OZ. And uh, yeah, my presentation here is, is how, how we can team with uh, a native pollinators on the landscape. Um, and I just wanted to give a bit of background about who OZ is, um, our mission, is to increase awareness of the various values, the economic, social, environmental like values or benefits of having trees in the landscape. So both agroforestry and woodlots. Uh, and, and that's kind of, yeah, ex expanded to, yeah, to, to forests in, in the landscape. Tr shrubs is in there and, and the herbaceous understory of forests is, is important too. So it's, I guess it's not just the, the tall trees, uh, especially when we get down into the grasslands area where, where, where Wheatland County is. Um, but yeah, we're trying to in increase awareness of having natural habitats uh, in and around private land. And we focus on Alberta. We're a nonprofit society. We began as the Woodlot Extension Program back in 2000. Um, and uh, Woodlot is kind of any uh, tract of private forested land. Um, but we added the A, the agroforestry, into our name in 2010. And that was to reflect the understanding that a lot of private forested land in Alberta, well, a lot of private land in Alberta has agricultural activity in and around it. And so for us, that meant opportunities for uh, integrating uh, um, agricultural land uses and, and, and forest land uses uh, together and finding uh, comp complementary benefits between them, which is what agroforestry is, is all about. 
Um, and how we work, we provide extension, so education, uh, workshops like this, presentations, tours, um, that sort of thing, um, and, and also planting services to land managers. So, not, uh, so farmers, for sure, but also acreage owners, ranchers, land trusts, different levels of government. So working on private land, um, for sure. So if after this presentation, any of you have any questions or are looking to sort of get assistance with your projects, um, we can do everything from uh, just provide advice and guidance to uh, we work with uh, professional tree planters every spring and uh, we can help you source stock and, and uh, develop the design and, and, and make the, the project happen. Um, yeah, so uh, and, that, and that can be anything from eco buffers to shelter belts to riparian buffers, uh, food forests, uh, anything to do with uh, trees in, in the landscape. Um, right, so my presentation here, what I'm focusing on uh, today is uh, starting out with the what and who of pollination. So kind of like pollination 101 uh, and its importance. Um, then moving into the habitat needs of pollinators. So what, what, they, what they need to survive on the landscape, how you can establish pollinator habitat. And then I'll just end with a quick little case study of, of us doing that. Um, yeah, and, and uh, just to give it a bit of context. Um, so yeah, yeah, hopefully uh, this will be a benefit. So starting with the what and who. So yeah, pollination is 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 basically it's 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 plant sex, and uh, because plants are stationary, they've enlisted helpers to uh, help them do it, and uh, three quarters of them have enlisted animal helpers or pollinators. Uh, Seventy-five percent of flowering plants depend on pollinators. The rest maybe use wind or water to transfer um, their, their 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 pollen. And um, yeah, basically the idea is you're, the pollinators are moving uh, from the uh, male part of the flower, the anther, uh, to the uh, female part of the, either the same flower or a different flower, the, the stigma. Um, so um, a lot of plants depend on pollinators. And these plants, these 75% of all plants, they happen to make up about a third of our food supply. So a lot of foods you see in this picture, and in Alberta, common crops you grow around here, beans, sunflower, canola, alfalfa, flaxseed, mustard seed, clovers, a lot of vegetables and fruits. All those de uh, depend or benefit greatly from, uh, from having animal pollinators. But it's not just about humans that, that benefit or de depend on having uh, the, uh, pollinators doing their work. It's pollinators also provide food and habitat for many other non-humans, uh, from chickadees that are eating sunflower seeds or or using different trees that depend on pollinators for their habitat. And so just want to really make the case that pollinators, we, we talk about, if you ever heard of the term keystone species, or keystone species like pollinators is like, without them, taking them out of the ecosystem, the rest of the ecosystem really starts to crumble. And so yeah, really make, yeah, really uh, in, important to, to protect and to have in there. And so, okay, so we're talking about pollinators, who pollinates? Um, well, bees mostly, people think about pollinators, they often think about bees and rightly so, they're the most important pollinator um, and most efficient pollinator. But there are also wasps, flies, beetles, ants, butterflies, moths, birds, bats, and even humans when there's no other animal in landscape, such as in greenhouses or in highly intensive agricultural landscapes, humans will go around with paintbrushes. But for the, yeah, for the most part, a bunch of different insects, in particular bees. And when people think about bees, they often think about the European honeybee. You think about bees, you think about honey. Um, and, and the European honeybee is really important. Uh, it's responsible for three to five billion increased production in Canada annually. Um, and you'll see like these hives that, are, that go around like in southern Alberta and are, are, are pollinating the um, uh, canola fields and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, they're really important uh, uh, for, for increasing yields and, and for producing honey as well. Um, but in this presentation today, I'm going to be focusing more on, on uh, native bees or wild bees um, because I think they get a lot of le le less uh, attention than honeybees, uh, which are non-native species. They, they came from Europe, uh, but they're really, really important. Um, and yeah, they're important to think about and they're really important pollinators. So in Alberta, last totals, we've, we've found 321 species of bees native to Alberta. That's more species of, of bees or twice as many species of bees as the mammals, um, birds, amphibians, and reptiles combined. So twice as many of all, as all those other species uh, combined. So there's a lot of different bees here in Alberta. Uh, and, and native bees happen to be more efficient than any other pollinator, including honeybees. And they're, that's just because they're adapted to our conditions here in Alberta. 
They, they forage earlier in the day in wetter conditions, in, in colder conditions, and certain pollinators, in particular things like, like bumblebees, they have this feature where they, they go into a deep flower and they buzz pollinate. So they, they get in there and they're, they, bzz, they, 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 they just buzz around inside of it and they're showering themselves with pollen and, and, and just mixing and mingling and, and, and it's getting a lot on them, but also getting a lot in, in, the, in the flower. And so doing a really good job of actually pollinating that flower. Anyways, point is, is that uh, these native bees are, are incredible pollinators that can really, yeah, um, help, um, help plants reproduce, help them set seed. And the other benefit of, of, of native bees in landscape is you don't have to uh, rent them. You don't have to um, ha rent hives, like if you're a, a canola a seed producer or something for honeybees to, to, to bring these hives in, uh, cost money. You don't have to do that for bees. You just have to provide them with habitat. And I, I want to just make this highlight this importance in another way. There's, there's a few different studies. This is just uh, um, on uh, science is increasingly um, sort of, or scientific research is increasingly appreciating just how important having pollinators and also other beneficial insects like pest suppressing insects uh, in the landscape. Um, they're, they're increasingly kind of uh, catching up to that uh, understanding. And um, there's been a number of studies in, in, in Alberta too. There's been some recent work on this. I think Grant might be talking about that a bit in his presentation, but I wanted to highlight this sort of study because I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's a really neat, it's neat study. So basically in this study, went from 2006 to 2011, uh, they, they planted pollinator habitat, they established pollinator habitat in, in these uh, cropland, in, and this is actually in England. Uh, so it's a different context, but it is rapeseed. So basically similar to canola, um, wheat and field beans. So not, not too dissimilar of a rotation than what you see here in Alberta. And, and they looked at the yields here on, on the y-axis. Um, and they looked at it in three different situations. They had the control where no pollinator habitat was uh, established and that's the, the black circles. They had the white squares where 4% uh, of the land was given up to pollinators. And they had the, um, the, the triangle, black triangles here where 8% of the land was given up to pollinators. And you see that at the beginning, uh, because they established this habitat, they've taken cropland out for, for providing habitat for pollinators. You have reduced yields uh, on the, uh, uh, for, the, for the triangles where 8% was, was given out. But as the six years goes along, as the habitat establishes itself, in the end, 8% is higher yields than the 4%, 4% is higher yields than the, uh, than the 0%. And so over time, those pollinators were providing services and also in this case, pest suppressing insects as well. Uh, we're providing services to the cropland that was increasing yields more than making up for the, the, the loss of land being taken out for production. Uh, and that's, that's really important. It's, um, and, and research like this is happening in Alberta as well. So I've been talking about pollinators. I'm talking about bees for a little bit. I just want to just want to uh, jump back a second and, and uh, actually Sonia, if you wouldn't mind, um, maybe I'll just even stop sharing uh, or yeah, let's just start with this. Uh, uh, which, which one of these uh, insects in this photo is not a bee? And uh, Sonia, I think you created a, a poll for this. Ah, nice. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wanna just see, uh, just to see what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about bees here, so you can start to recognize it in and around your fields, please choose in the poll, which one of these insects is not a bee? Top left, top right, bottom left, or bottom right? And I just wanna see, um, if, if everybody can, can use the polls um, and uh, fill out, we'll give you a few minutes here. Or we'll give you about, really should take just about 15 seconds here, so. I'll just give it five more seconds. Okay, good. We've got four different insects here. Okay, we'll see. stop it. All right, let's see, can we see the results or? Okay, so we have top left, top right. So top right is apparent is the winner. It's got the most um, bottom left and, uh, and, and bottom right. Um, okay, uh, yeah, well done and, and, and no, no need to, like this is, this is hard to do. There are a lot of different kinds of bees out there and that's kind of the point. They really look different uh, from each other and different than what you would normally think about from a bee. So it turns out, that the the uh, the the, poll the pollen they're all pollinators in this picture, but the pollinator that's not actually a bee 
in this case is, is in the top left. It's a hoverfly. Um, and, and, it's, and it's tricky, I'm almost tricking you here, because it's a bee mimic. It's evolved to look a lot like bees, uh, probably to avoid uh, getting uh, e eaten. Um, but all these other ones, uh, these are uh, different kinds of bees. Um, Agapostomin bee, or type of sweat bee. Um, uh, Lazioglossum bee, which is a teeny, teeny, tiny little bee. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this is a ro wild rose petal for, for scale, so it's really small. And then, of course, uh, most people recognize the bumblebee. Um, and so, yeah, like when you're looking and, and, and going around and seeing uh, what different insects are, how you kind of tell bee, what a bee looks like is, well, bees are fuzzy. That's the important thing. This fly is fuzzy as well. Um, but you can tell that bees are fuzzy. They're different than wasps that way. Um, and then also bees have four wings. Flies have two wings. Bees, their four wings, they tend to tuck behind them when they land, like this agapostum in here. Um, uh, flies tend to splay spl them out. And then they're really tall in the eyes. The flies have bigger eyes that are more toward the, the front of their head and shorter antennae, and the, and the bees have longer antennae uh, and, and, and eyes that are smaller and towards the sides of their head. So, I mean, hard to get a, sometimes a close-up like this, but when you're looking around, uh, start to recognize the different kinds of bees that are, that are uh, in, in the landscape around you. And yeah, and I just, I'll just zoom in I, I, uh, um, on, on these different pictures. Uh, this is a, a sweat bee, so a, uh, our type of sweat bee. Uh, Lazioglossum bee. Uh, so there's 61 species of, of Lazioglossum bee in Alberta. Like there's just, there's, there's so much diversity. Uh, and then a bumblebee, there's 29 species of bees. And then this hoverfly. And, and I, I'm, I'm saying this is not a bee, but it's, I'm not saying that to sort of discount its importance. Uh, hoverflies also are pollinators uh, and, they, and, they, and they do important pollination. They're not as efficient as, as bees, uh, but they make up for that in numbers. And there's a lot of different species of them in Alberta. Yeah, and in general, these are just, that's just a, a snapshot of, of some of the species. There's a lot, and this is also a snapshot. There's a lot of different other kinds of bees out there from the Andrena bees, the Osmia bees, Osmia mason bees, Megachile bees, or the leaf cutter bees. And then there's other insects as well that do pollination, like ladybugs. Um, there's tach, tachnid flies, or, and other kinds of flies, like butterflies, uh, and then lacewings um, also uh, do, do pollination, uh, transfer pollen and nectar, or transfer uh, pollen, sorry. And I wanted to highlight here that um, it turns out that a lot of pollinators are also pest suppressors. Um, so pest suppressors being any insect that sort of eats, uh, pre predates on, or, or parasitizes uh, pest species and keeps populations under control more or less. And, and this is a really important and underrated service. Uh, in, in Canada, it is estimated they provided 5 billion in, in services and increased production uh, in the year 2010 here. And so, yeah, just to, to highlight, like, example, parasitoid wasps, these little wasps that go around and parasitize on, um, on different, uh, the larvae of different pest species and, and, and other species. So having, and what I'm trying to say by this is when you're creating pollinator habitat here, um, uh, you're doing more than just providing habitat for pollinator. You're providing habitat for potentially uh, insects that will pollinate, but also suppress pests and, uh, and, and do other functions as well. And, and so I'm, I'll talk about those later on. Um, I should mention bees are not pest suppressors, just to clarify that. Bees are vegetarian, they just eat pollen and nectar. But a lot of these uh, uh, pest suppressors sort of, they maybe sip on, on nectar uh, in the off season and then will uh, uh, kind of parasitize or predate on pests uh, when, when, when the pests are, are in, uh, when there's a lot of them out there. And I also wanted to, to kind of highlight, because people have been concerned, and rightly so, about the status of, of bees uh, right now, and, and concerns about their, um, their current abundance and diversity. Um, and this is kind of a, a relatively up-to-date study on, on how, how they are right now in Alberta. 44% um, uh, of them, uh, so, so we, just over half of them are apparently secure or secure, but 44% but of them are, are in the here, in this category, vulnerable, unrankable, we don't have enough data about them or imperiled or critically imperiled. And so there's, yeah, there, there's, there is cause to be concerned for, for, for native uh, bees in Alberta and there are threats facing them. And so both in terms of improving productivity on, on your own lands if you're, if you're farming, uh, but also in terms of uh, the greater biodiversity and, and ecology, um, it's, it's, yeah, protecting and promoting uh, pollinators is really important. So how do we do that? Well, I guess the next part of my presentation, I'm going to start talking about the habitat needs of pollinators. So what they need to survive. And I mean, the, the, the main habitat needs, most important is food. So reliable access to pollen and nectar, uh, shelter, 
So nesting and overwintering sites and, and safety, so protection from pesticides. And there's more to it than this, but, but this is, if you, if you get these um, taken care of, you're doing pretty well. And so I'm talking with food first. So to ensure reliable access to pollen and nectar, I recommend choosing flowering species or uh, it's best to have flowering species with diverse shapes, sizes, colors, and bloom periods. So different pollinators are attracted to different kinds of flowers. Um, and some, uh, there's, uh, anecdotal evidence that, that bees like yellows and purples, flies and wasps prefer whites. Uh, smaller pollinators tend to not be able to use uh, shallower flowers because they have shorter tongues. So they can get into things like yarrow or this uh, wild rose here, where, whereas uh, other uh, larger pollinators like bumblebees have longer tongues and they can access the nectar in, in deeper flowers. I think this is a lupin here. <clears throat> and so um, basically what we're arguing for here is just to have a diversity out there so you'll be able to attract a diversity uh, in return. And bloom periods, having diverse bloom periods is, is particularly important. And, and, and why is that? Well, I just want to show this chart here. This chart is uh, on the left side, now going down here, we have a whole bunch of different B types. And on the uh, x-axis here, on the horizontal axis, we have months through the growing season, April through to September. And these arrows are when each of these B types is actively foraging. So B, B genera B types is actively foraging uh, through, the, through the season. Some have very uh, long periods of time where they're foraging, they're looking for pollen nectar, and some have shorter times. And this yellow bar in July here is, happens to be when canola is blooming. And this is just to say that if you only had canola in, this, in your system, you'd be able to provide food for these pollinators only for this amount of time. And for the rest of the time, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have any food and they wouldn't really be in your area. And, and, and so it's, it's not ideal. And so what we're looking for instead of this is something more along this line here, uh, a situation more where we have, um, uh, this is a whole bunch of different species of, of, in this case, trees and shrubs on the, uh, on, on the a list of them going down here. Again, the months through the growing season here. And he, these bars here indicate when these uh, species are flowering. And so what we're seeing here is a, a different picture where we have, let's say in the beginning part of the season, you have the buffalo berries flowering moving through the Saskatoons and the willows that have a nice long bloom period and getting into uh, later on with the uh, Hybush cranberries. And, and I, I guess I'm in Edmonton, Hybush cranberry doesn't really grow down where you are. Um, but, but then in the buckbrush and snowbirdy uh, berry towards the end here. And so this allows pollinators to sort of jump from flower to flower over the season and, and, and kind of keep on getting whatever is in flower, have food throughout the season. So that's really good. And I like this chart because it's like really, it, it kind of makes that point really well, but it's limited in a couple of ways, I guess you can see here, April, May, June, July, August, it kind of ends in August, it, like barely anything is flowering in August and September is not even on here. And I guess why this chart is limited is, is it's only looking at trees and shrubs here. And I want to just highlight that the importance of, it's not just about the trees and shrubs, particularly in the grasslands. Um, it's definitely about the, uh, the forbs or the, or the wildflowers. And, and the forbs are really important because, well, they have incredible diversity. Um, so getting that herbaceous layer of different flowers, goldenrod, asters, um, fireweed, um, yarrow, all those sorts of flowers. Yeah, are really important. They have a massive diversity throughout the season, but particularly towards the end of the season, you'll see things like goldenrod buzzing with, uh, with, with bees because there's not much else in flower at that time. And so having in, in, in the Aspen Parkland where I am, I'm, I'm based in Edmonton, having both trees and shrubs, uh, or particularly shrubs and, and, and forbs in, in pollinator habitat, is really important. And in the grasslands, even just having uh, uh, just, just wildflowers, just forbs is sufficient. Or, or, or trees and shrubs if you're around water, uh, for sure. Um, we have a native pollinator friendly plant list for the Aspen Parkland, so a bit north of where you are, but there will be a lot of overlap um, that you can refer to from our, our website here. And I know Wheatland County has also put together a pollinator friendly plant list as well, and uh, we'll be, um, I think they will be uh, distributing that after uh, this, this webinar here. So yeah, don't forget the forbs. The wildflowers are really important. Um, and I also want to highlight a list of native plant vendors where you can get different native uh, wildflowers and forbs can be found from the Alberta Native Plant Council's homepage. And you just go down here, native plant source list, click on the Excel spreadsheet and you'll find a bunch of different vendors from across actually the prairies and, and be able to hopefully source uh, tree shrubs or, for, or, 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 or wildflowers and grasses too uh, from, from, from a vendor near you. And I'm kind of getting, uh, and, yes. And so, yeah, that's, that's the important thing to think about in terms of uh, species there. 
Uh, another kind of design feature that helps with, with, uh, with uh, creating pollinator habitat is, is using clumping. So clumping flowering species together makes things easier for the bees. And so basically what we're, we're thinking about here is um, bees, when they leave the hive, they tend to only focus on one flower at a time, whatever's most in bloom. So they'll only go to go goldenrod on a single foraging trip, or they'll only go to a dogwood or something. And so that just means that if you put those species together in small clumps through the landscape, rather than just randomly distributed, um, they'll, they'll just be that much more efficient. Um, and that's kind of what's happened in nature too, uh, typically. Like you'll have like a, a choke cherry grove that's been growing under a, a tree or something where a bird's been pooping out choke cherry seeds for, for years and things grow in clumps often anyways. And so mimicking that is, is a great idea if you can, but that's not really mandatory. If you're creating a lot of habitat, this, I wouldn't get caught up on that, especially if you're seeding it. Um, so just, just something to consider though. Um, that's a, a design feature to think about. And I, I, I kind of mentioned the, the Native Plant Council website there, and I'm, I'm focusing here a lot on native flowering species, because uh, those are ideal for, for pollinators, uh, for native pollinators, uh, and actually for pest suppressing insects as well. Um, they've evolved and adapted to use these species, these species and so they're, they're shown to have be preferred by uh, native pollinators uh, overall. And, and other studies have shown that they're less likely to provide pest habitat. Um, so they provide habitat for maybe the pest suppressors, the good guys, but they're less likely to provide pest habitat than maybe non-native species. And the reason for that is a lot of our pests in, in this part of the world, that, well, in many parts of the world are, are, are non-native. They've been brought over, like the cabbage maggot was brought over from, from, from Europe. Um, and, and, so it's, and now it's rampant across the prairies. And, 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 that's, and so planting native species won't benefit the cabbage maggot, but it might benefit its predators or parasites. Um, and so, yeah, focusing on natives as much as possible is, is ideal. And I know it's sometimes hard to, to get native species and they're more expensive, but this is, I just want to throw this out there. And they don't have to be, but it, but it, but it helps. And I already mentioned the Alberta Native uh, Plant Council homepage there. Okay, that was all about food and that's kind of the most important habitat need there. Um, just checking the time here, good. Um, we're on to nesting and overwintering sites. Um, so uh, it turns out about 80% of Alberta's wild bees nest in the soil. So yeah, this is getting into shelter. So a lot of people think about bees, they think about hives, and, and that's true with honeybees, um, but, but most of our bees here are solitary and a, and, and a lot of them nest in the soil and they'll burrow down in the soil, lay their eggs, provision them with pollen and nectar and sort of create cells like that going up. And so having undisturbed areas of soil, the cultivation will destroy this. Uh, and so having undisturbed areas of soil and like bare patches and stuff like that, which is, you don't have to actually clear area. It'll, they'll find little bare patches to, to utilize and they'll, and they'll go down and, and nest here. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you provide shelter for a lot of Alberta's wild bee species. And then 20% of Alberta's now wild bee species uh, nest above ground um, in, in, beetle, in old beetle burrows left in uh, deadfall in the hollow stems of let's say um, rushes or or reeds or cats, um, um, uh, raspberry canes or, or something like that. They'll burrow in there and, and lay their, their eggs and provision them with uh, uh, pollen nectar again. They'll line it, if it's a mason bee, they might line it with um, um, uh, like mud. Uh, if it's a leaf cutter bee, they'll line their nest cells with, with little leaf fragments here. Um, yeah, and they'll create their nest like this. These are slightly less common uh, in the grasslands because they don't have this kind of woody material so abundant, uh, or you guys don't have that so much down there. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there will be some uh, in the, uh, particularly in the, uh, around the coolies and, and, and stuff like that where you have more trees. And then the final thing would be protection from pesticides for, in terms of habitat needs. So insecticides, well, they can affect the species directly uh, while, while herbicides can affect the habitat. So insecticides, yeah, if, if there's any drift um, uh, inadvertently affect uh, pollinators, should, should be restricted from where pollinators are and herbicides can drift in and, and reduce flower diversity the way what they eat. And so, um, yeah, trying to uh, ensure protection from pesticides. Uh, evergreen trees is one strategy. Again, I, I, I'm not sure about so much in your context, uh, if it's really dry, um, but uh, that's one way to reduce uh, drift in general. Um, I just make sure that uh, you would not have your, if you have large trees and you're planting, make sure it's not shading out your planting. You want your planting to be nice and, and uh, your habitat to be nice and sunny to get a lot of uh, diversity here. And, and just doing things to try to reduce drift uh, that is impacting your habitat. 
Okay, so now I'm getting into part three, which is establishing pollinator habitat. So how do you kind of take all these lessons and, and turn it into something? And I wanted to highlight here some potential sites to think about, like agricultural landscapes that are diverse, they're a mosaic of different kind of ty types of habitat and stuff like that. And where, where are good opportunities to, 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 to establish pollinator habitat? And, and uh, one really good example is around wet areas, wetlands, things like that, where you may not be getting great yields anyways. Um, marginal lands, I know that's uh, Alice's kind of bread and butter and uh, Sarah might be talking about that later on. Um, and so those are really great um, areas to, to establish pollinator habitat. And there's been some research about how important little wetlands and croplands are for supporting populations of pollinators. Um, and then there's others like in ditches along existing shelter belts, if you have uh, pivot irrigation in the corners of pivot irrigation, anywhere that, yeah, just uh, cropping doesn't really make sense. And even, and even elsewhere, I'll get into that uh, later on even giving up cropland for, for pollinator habitat has those yield benefits that I mentioned earlier. So establishing, think about potential sites. And then what I really recommend especially is notice and protect what you already have. So in this example here, like I've just blown up this image of this ditch and it looks like the, wow, there's some native wildflowers here. There's like blank, there's uh, Gallardia in here. Um, I think there's some different kinds of clovers and stuff and there's already habitat growing and just uh, recognizing that, beginning to recognize what, what bees look like and how they're using it and, and native wildflowers uh, is, is really important um, and, and that's the easiest thing to do um, because it's pretty hard and expensive or it can be to establish it uh, from, from the ground up. And then the other thing would be to manage what you have for, for, for productivity for, for longevity and uh, I'm not going to get into this um, there's, yeah, talking about different kinds of management. This is more grant, what Grant will talk about later, later on here maybe. Uh, this is a, a mentor of mine, uh, Don Rosica, and he's, he, he manages, uh, he had, he's recently retired, but he's managed his, uh, his uh, farm, his ranch for, for many years and, uh, and, and grazes in ways that allows for uh, the alfalfa to rejuvenate itself, for the different flowers to rejuvenate itself. And he has lots of uh, buffer areas around to provide refuge habitat for the pollinators. And uh, he's, he, in this case, um, he doesn't, he doesn't need to reseed his, his, uh, his his fields, his hay fields, or his um, his pasture land. Um, I, I think it was it was running on two decades. He wasn't uh, needing to to do that um, like a lot of other farmers in his area uh, do. He, he lives in East Central Alberta, in Flagstaff County. Um, so yeah, just managing what you already have. This is this is uh, going to be talked about more with uh, Grant. And then the other thing to think about would be to connect existing habitat. So the phrase, if you build it, they will come, applies if they are in the general area for, for pollinators. And so, yeah, making sure you're looking at what you already have and then sort of connecting it across the landscape to the extent possible. Um, and, and, and strips are really important uh, here. And, and I'll get into how far pollinators can fly uh, in, in, in a second here. But, but yeah, thinking about uh, your landscape on a landscape scale is really important. And so now I'm going to just uh, talk about here how to actually establish your habitat. So let's say you've, you've, you have some habitat or maybe you're, you're, you're managing things well, but now you're actually wanting to enhance what, you're, what you have or kind of increase, provide new habitat. And we have a six uh, phase process for um, going through how to establish habitat. Um, and in, uh, in particular, we focus, because our, our kind of background, we focus on woody habitat, so tree, tree planting. Um, so anything with eco buffers, shelter belts, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on that in my part of the presentation. And I think um, Grant in the second hour will be talking more about uh, seeding in uh, herbaceous uh, areas and, and how to just maintain and manage, uh, um, yeah, the, our, our non woody species more. So anyways, I, I want to highlight that this is kind of what I'm focusing on for the last little bit here. And um, yeah, uh, we have this three part tree planting on farms video series. Uh, and I'll, I'll link it uh, later on here, but this goes through these six steps uh, really clear and you can kind of watch it at your leisure and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of right uh, taken from one of our sites that we, uh, we, we did uh, this past year here. Um, so I just want to go through the steps quickly. Uh, we start our, our, our habitat establishment with an assessment of our goals and site conditions. So what do we want to achieve from our site and what is our site looking like, like in terms of soils and existing vegetation and stuff like that. We have this handy ticky box style worksheet for planting assessment. Um, so uh, yeah, you can um, uh, basically go through it and it'll help you jog your memory or, or make you think about all the things that hopefully you should be thinking about when you're looking to establish uh, habitat. 
so that's a useful tool that's available on our website. And keeping in mind, yeah, you're thinking about the different goals using this worksheet, your habitat could do more than just provide pollinators and even pest suppressing insects. You're thinking about how to, like thinking very holistically on your landscape about how your habitat could also be trapping snow for you. Uh, it could be providing fruits or other food uh, woody uh, products. It could be protecting your water um, in terms of water quality, but also improving your flood and drought resilience. Um, and then uh, uh, creating shelter for your livestock, for crops. There's been studies uh, to show uh, conclusively that, that having um, shelter, um, um, shelter belts uh, in, 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 in landscapes will increase, uh, on average, will increase uh, your crop productivity, making up for the land taking out of uh, production. Uh, so there's, there's many different things you can do with trees, many different values you can have and, and sort of thinking about them uh, holistically um, is, is really important here. So then you, once you kind of think about your goals and your sites, you get into your design, asking yourself, where do I, where do I plant and, and what, do I, what do I plant? And I'll just go through these quickly. We often use a program called Google Earth Pro to, to map out our designs. We make little lines going around, let's say this is a wetland in some hayfield. We'll make lines, measure out how long they are and, uh, and, and how we can uh, add, uh, yeah, like basically how many trees we'll need in uh, given, given the length and everything like that. So I re highly recommend if you haven't, aren't acquainted with it, you can Google Google Earth Pro and download it. It's a free program and you can do a lot of uh, cool things with it. And I also want to highlight another resource. Uh, we have our Oz Native Agroforestry Species Database on our website. Um, and I should, yeah, I should mention that, that this presentation will be available after. So if I'm going through these links too quickly, you can re refer to it after the fact. Um, but yeah, this allows you to go and select your natural region uh, and, and choose a whole bunch of different plant characteristics that you might be interested in. So you can choose plants that depend on pollinators. You can choose plants that grow fast and, and, and the list goes on. You can scroll down here on, on the left side and, and it's just really um, a great way to see what might do well in your area and what might meet your goals as well. So that's uh, a database that's available on our website. And then we get into sourcing stock, the third step. So you have different options for establishing. Uh, in a lot of our tree planting projects, we use seedlings. Uh, so we order it from nurseries and, and plant them out. Um, you can also, uh, an easy DIY project is to take stem cuttings, uh, willow, poplar, or, um, or dogwood. Those are ones that establish well from cuttings and, and, and grow them out or, or, or stick them in the ground and, and they should grow it if you, if you do it right. And we have a fact sheet on how to do that if you have any questions. And then another option is seeding uh, in, in, in habitat as well, particularly for herbaceous species, this is important. Um, and then moving into site preparation. So preparing your site uh, for, for planting. Uh, so you need to address competing vegetation. So existing, uh, let's say this is smooth brome here. It's got a thick sod mat, lots of root mass that's gonna really compete with any seedlings that you wanna plant there. It has to be dealt with ahead of time. And also addressing soil compaction um, beforehand is really important because uh, if you're trying to plant anything, uh, the roots won't go deep in the soil and be able to, yeah, to, to survive, uh, especially in drier climates if, if the soils are compacted. And just to show you some different options that we've used in the past, um, uh, tilling in strips, uh, staying above the high water line here, but tilling in strips um, can be one way uh, and, uh, to, to break up the soil and, and uh, get, get the bed ready for, for planting. We've also done lower impact sort of stuff. If you have an existing hayfield or pasture or something like that, and you want to establish trees through it, plowing in strips, um, and then planting along the furrows of the plow, kind of on the hinge of the, of the flip as the plow is uh, um, yeah, flipping over the sod here. That's one way to do it as well. And we've also used little mini excavators to create mounds. And they basically reached in there and flip over the sod in little patches. And when we plant uh, on those, on, again, on the hinge of the flip with there and, and just to reduce our impact on the, on the overall landscape rather than tilling it all up. So anyways, these are some different options that we've used to prepare the sites. And then I wanna highlight also mulches can provide longer term weed control and another benefit. So uh, uh, different mulches uh, we've used in the past to, uh, um, to control our weeds in our plantings and, and make sure that uh, um, they, uh, the so also it helps with soil moisture, reducing evaporation rates um, and uh, um, and, and yeah, and, and just uh, it can break down in, into the soil here. Um, and I'll just quickly, I think I have time just to quickly show, we. this is from one of our videos that I mentioned before. 
And it's, I think it does a better job of explaining than I could about like, because we're doing it in the field here. I'll just show you some different options if you're interested in uh, planting trees. Mulching is really important here. So I'll just uh, expand this here and I'll show you. I might uh, turn off my camera actually here too, so we get better quality. Okay, I'll just show you that. Mentioned in the earlier videos, the weeds will grow quickly. And so we got to do something to make sure that we're, we're suppressing them in the, in the microsite around uh, where the seedlings are so they don't get uh, competition either above ground or below ground. And for that we use mulch. So in this particular project we've used two different kinds of mulch. We use hemp mats and biodegradable plastic mulch. Um, so starting with, with uh, hemp mats, we used hemp mats uh, on any of the sites uh, across our areas where we, we've, we've had uh, where it's more difficult to access. So here is actually, we're going to eventually uh, most of this mulch with biodegradable plastic. But for places where we're not planting in a row or it's more challenging topography, um, that's where hemp mats can really come in handy. And these hemp mats, as you can see here, they're made of a woven hemp material made right here in Alberta by Hemp Bio Futures. And they've got a, a nice uh, little um, uh, cut down the, the side of them so you can fit them ni nice and easy around the, the seedlings um, like this. And you can pull up the, the branches of the seedlings around it. And we, we also get, get these uh, little wooden stakes here. And we, uh, we like to uh, pin them down with this, especially at windier sites. You don't have to. Uh, you can also use rocks. Or uh, once a nice rain hits these mats, they really conform to the ground nicely. So that's pretty useful. Um, but yeah, they're this woven hemp material. It takes at least a couple years to break down. And it's, it's, it's a great uh, weed suppression in that microsite around the seedling um, uh, during that time. Right, and so the other type of mulch we used for this project, for most of the project actually, is, is biodegradable plastic mulch. And biodegradable plastic mulch is a pretty new product. It's very similar to your standard uh, black plastic mulch. Uh, four foot wide by uh, 1,500 feet rolls is what it comes in. And, uh, and it's great for flat areas like this with well-prepared ground. Um, and the, uh, to, to, to apply biodegradable plastic mulch is the same as applying regular plastic mulch. It's, uh, it's using a, a mulch applicator that is available for rent or, or loan from many different counties across Alberta. Biodegradable plastic mulch, it, it's a corn-based product um, that biodegrades uh, after four to five years, after about three to four years of, 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 of solid weeds uh, suppression. And so, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take you over to... All right, so that was just the, I'll go back to here. Okay, that was just a little video on, on, our, on our process of mulch. I, I see I'm probably getting low on time here, so I'll just zoom through the last little bit here. Um, but yeah, that, those are two different mulching options that we've used. Wood chips are another option, and straw is another option too. Straw can contain weed seeds and be a little bit less effective, but yeah, just to highlight that. And then planting is kind of the next stage. Um, and you, you watch the video for our planting techniques. Um, and we also have fact sheets about how to, how to plant trees and, uh, and things like that as well. And then maintenance uh, is the, kind of the last sort of ongoing thing. Once you establish habitat, you're not done. And the three W's of, of tree planting are things that you have to kind of watch out for when, when you're uh, maintaining uh, your, your, your planting. And that's uh, wildlife, which like things like voles can girdle the seedlings. And, uh, and, and this will kill the tree and deer and stuff and other things can browse down. Weeds can grow, even if you use plastic mulch, like in this picture, weeds can grow through holes in it if, if, like, if holes develop in it through, I don't know, deer walking along it or something or growing over the mulch and have to be, you still need to maintain it. Mulch doesn't get you away scot-free, that's for sure. Um, and then uh, water or lack thereof is another common threat and having mulch in places can help and also having an irrigation plan is, is important. Um, great. Okay. So those are the, that's kind of the theory about it. And I just want to finish with this little case study of, we established some pollinator habitat in uh, Vermilion River County. So this is in East Central Alberta, uh, between two wetlands and this little piece of cropland that was, uh, it was sometimes was, uh, just was awkward to, to farm in because it's a very small little chunk here. And so, yeah, the farmer wanted to, to plant a little eco buffer here along the outside and then have a little uh, native, native seeded meadow here with some patches of, of habitat of, of, of woody species kind of throughout. And so we had a planting day where we planted both uh, native wildflowers here and he was gonna seed in some native grasses. 
And we also planted uh, trees and sh uh, shrubs. And you can kind of see here, this is the going around the, the edge of the planting here, where we planted a, a bunch of trees and shrubs where those flags are. And yeah, the, the next, this, this fall, he uh, unfortunately didn't get, it was, uh, he didn't get a chance to seed in the native grasses, so he everything was still black, and so he worked hard to keep this black this first year. And so he didn't, we didn't use mulch in this case. Uh, uh, we we just kept the soil black, which is another option. It's labor intensive, but it can also work. And yeah, the trees have put on a little bit of growth here in the fall. And then yeah, here are some of the the native wildflowers: the thunder blue beer tongue on the left, and some fleabane here. Um, and then this is the next spring, so a year later uh, in total. Uh, we have um, some growth uh, that are hap that is already happening for these species, um, uh, as uh, yeah, in, in, in the eco buffer here, and uh, and yeah, here's some of the the, the patches of uh, flowers and, and trees and shrubs in, in there um, in in the habitat. We, we planted plugs and patches and hoping that they're going to spread out through this native grass that he's recently seeded in here. And uh, I just want to show you this last video. Um, I just got from my friend. Uh, in July 2020. So this is three years of growth, and you can see this is around a riparian area. It's, it's grown a lot. It's put on a lot of growth. Uh, riparian areas, they grow trees. So already kind of starting to function as a buffer. It's already providing shelter, pollinator habitat, and everything like this. So if you get things right, kind of at the beginning. Um, there's some, some, I think that's a uh, giant piece up in there, and this is just a, a shot taking through. But yeah, these trees are, are quite tall already. We put on a few feet of growth a year, I think. Um, and it, it'll, um, yeah, it, it, it can work out. And over time with these kind of eco-buffer plantings, we're hoping that, and I think they will, uh, they're going to sucker through and just kind of fill in the rows between, so you won't even be able to tell where they originally planted. Um, that's kind of the goal. So, anyways, that's... My presentation here, I just want to conclude with saying that Alberta is teaming with native pollinators that can increase farm productivity and resilience. So they really can be a great allies in agriculture. And I'm arguing to team up with them by conserving or planting diverse flowering plants, ideally those that are native to your area, but diverse flowering plants is a, is a great way to start. Um, and I have some more resources here, some of the ones I mentioned. Um, you can go to the Xerces Society in the States. They have a lot of great publications on establishing pollinators meadows from seed. We have fact sheets on a lot of different things that I was talking about. And there's also the Alberta Native Bee Council, which uh, I'm also a part of. And they have brochures and um, different instructions for building bumblebee houses and other, and other fun things. So with that, I will finish off here and hand over the, well, I guess we can, we can have a bit of Q&A here uh, for the next little bit here. And then before handing it over to Sarah and or Grant. So. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Luke. That's a lot of really great information that you provided. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, um, so the first question is, um, so last spring we planted three acres of Hascap berries, um, three different varieties in a fenced off area in close proximity to a bison pasture and they have a herd of 40. Um, close to the Hascaps are native poplar trees and other native shrubs. We are currently in the process of acquiring honeybees, which we plan on putting in the Hascaps. Her question is, where specifically do you re recommend we place the bees in relation to the Hascaps? And two, would you recommend we plant one or more additional plants in between the rows of Hascaps for diversity? And um, if so, three, what type of plants would you recommend planting? And for contacts, they are located right at the dividing line between Rocky View County and Mountain View County, northwest of Crossfield. Okay. I mean, let me just, uh, I, I, I just found that question on the chat. For some reason, I didn't see it at first. Um, okay, cool, <laughs> great question. There's a lot of stuff there. And actually that, that reminds me, uh, here, I'll, I'll put back on my video. Um, that reminds me, I, uh, I didn't mention how far bees will travel into, into fields, which is an important thing. I must have taken out that slide accidentally. So this is important. Um, it, native bees, the median foraging range is, uh, is uh, for native bees is about 150 meters. So most native bees will, will travel around 150 meters or up to 150 meters. And then if you, but if, if getting 
beyond that, like there's, there's big variations. So bumblebees will travel even up to a couple kilometers away. And, um, and, and the little teeny little bees, like the Lazio blossom I showed you at the beginning, they'll only travel maybe like 50 meters. So, but if you can have habitat so that your habitat is within, like closer is always better, but within 150 meters means that a lot, most of the pollinators will be able to, uh, should be able to access whatever crop you want to get uh, pollinated, I guess. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, honeybees are different. They kind of break that trend of, of or they're, they're like, because they're, uh, they create such big hives. I mean, they, they have bees that'll, that'll travel up to almost 10 kilometers away. Uh, but they won't like to do that. They won't do that all the time, but they can really travel far. So if you have honeybees, um, you, uh, you, yeah, you, you're, if you're anywhere within like a kilometer or something of, of your, of your, uh, where you're wanting things to get pollinated, you're in, you're, you're, you're pretty good. I, I mean, obviously closer is always better and the bees are lazy. They'll use whatever is first and easiest to access. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's just a, a general response that kind of hopefully will help to address your, your question here. So yeah, placing the bees in relation to the has gaps. Um, and one more addition plants. I, yeah, I would absolutely recommend. Um, so has gaps are incredibly early flowers. And so having um, plants that sort of continue that throughout the season um, from <laughs> including other different kinds of shrubs, Saskatoons, choke cherries, choke cherries are really, a really good nectar resources, pollen resources and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you can include some, some wildflowers as well in there, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. Um, and uh, what types of plants would you recommend? Yeah, so what types of plants would you recommend planting would be, would be yeah, that are complementing the bloom period of, of your has gaps, I guess. Um, I should mention, just, just to put it out there, there is some uh, like competition effects and even disease transfer that can happen between honeybees and, and, and native uh, bees. And, and so having a lot of honeybees in the area has been shown to reduce native bee populations in that area because they, the honeybees are so plentiful, they, they sort of take over the flowers. And so I really like what you're saying here is, is looking to plant habitat because you're also, um, yeah, you're kind of hopefully helping to mitigate that impact of, of bringing in honeybees. Um, and then, um, yeah, by, by basically providing uh, forage for them, just like you would with any other um, species of livestock, I guess. Uh, so, um, yeah. That would, that, that, uh, but, but it sounds like, I mean, yeah, look what you already have. You have your native poplar trees and other native shrubs there. And, and I mean, if there's, if they're plentiful already, and if it's kind of within that, those ranges that I was talking about, maybe you won't need to, uh, uh, establish more, um, necessarily. Um, but it, but it, it can be al always beneficial and, and, uh, to, to, to get more species in there, particularly because you're introducing honeybees. So hope that helps. Um, do you want someone to read the question now? I, I can, I'm, I'm scrolling down here. Okay, so I see uh, Bet Betty's question. Uh, do you know if Alberta Transportation or counties are doing any work to make road right of ways be friendly? I know Alberta Innovates was working with uh, Alberta Transportation to come up with natives uh, uh, pollinator seed mixes. I, I don't know where that's going, uh, but I'm 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 really excited by that possibility because, yeah, I think if we if we get native species established in in in, in and around uh, road areas, like that's that's such a valuable thing uh, to be doing. And uh, if you get really good habitat establishment, maybe uh, less uh, weed weed spraying and things like that uh, in the future. Um, so that's happening. And I know they're, they're, it's, it's really taken off in, in cities as well. Like Calgary has its B Boulevard and Edmonton is working on things too. But um, yeah, there is, there is uh, talk about it. It's, it's a really good idea. Um, Are you in the Q&A? Oh, I'm looking at the comments. That's, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, this is why I had issues. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I didn't see that. What plant po population are you shooting for when establishing pollinator habitat? What plant population? Um, would you, I'm not sure what, like density of plants um, or like types of plants. Like uh, maybe I'll come back to that question if you wanted to clarify what you mean by plant population, unless any of the other panelists have an idea. 
I, I, I can allow Noah to talk if he wants if he wants some more um, specific direction on his question. Sure. Yeah, I know if you want to just take a second. Hi there. Hi. So I'm just wondering, like, how many plants per square foot? So, <clears throat> same idea as like when you're planting canola or any cash crops. How many you shoot for X amount of plants per square foot? How many? What? What? What would be a good uh, uh, kind of way way to shoot for to get your best bang for your buck as far as creating good habitat, but also not spending a ton of cash for for seed that's not necessarily going to be used. That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I I speak in I know trees and and shrubs uh, better than than uh, seeding rates. We've done a couple of seeding projects, and I, I I had numbers in a different presentation, but I don't have them with me. But I think that's a good question for for Grant. Uh, he'll be talking about seeding and stuff. I can say okay. for for planting trees and shrubs, like in our eco buffers, we would plant something every meter along, pretty dense, and then maybe two meters between rows or something like that. Um, but, but yeah, that's not what you're really looking for. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one for, for Grant. He'll, he, you know, this, those kind of things, I think. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, where, do, where does one get biodegradable plastic mulch? In, uh, we get ours from uh, Dubois Plastics out in Quebec. Um, and uh, we, uh, but yeah, work, work with counties or, or, or through us too. And if you're only looking for like one or two rolls or something, because yeah, it, it helps to, to buy in bulk. And so it's something we kind of buy every year. And so if you're interested in, like I had the uh, info, uh, I, I, uh, info at Oz uh, email address or go to our website and, and, and find our email address there. Uh, at the end, oh, I had the info at Oz at the end of my presentation there. Just email us and say you're interested in, and, and we'll try and figure something out. Um, but I think, yeah, this is something that's kind of a new product that we're, we're starting to work with and, and we're excited because yeah, dealing with plastic mulch in the long term, conventional plastic mulch can be really annoying. Um, uh, work and similar presentation, uh, where can I buy hemp mulch mats um, from, from Noah? Uh, uh, the um, hemp, so they used to be called hemp biofutures and I, I said that in the video, but they've since conglomerated into something called biocomposite groups um, and, and so just search biocomposite groups uh, in, in Google, and it's a, a company out of Drayton, Drayton Valley, and you'll, you'll look for their tree matting. And you, you can ask for it in different thicknesses. I actually recommend at least a 1,500 grams per square inch thickness to get you a weed suppression, and maybe about a 16 inch by 16 inch square uh, around. But you can, you can ask that and then get an order uh, shipped to you um, if you'd like. And, and again, if you're just looking for a small quantity, you can talk to Oz or, when you, or maybe your county. Um, oh, okay, no, I see your um, follow-up question there, good. Um, do bees pollinate the grasses? Uh, no, uh, good question, Michelle. Uh, bees uh, do not pollinate grasses. Uh, 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 those are wind pollinated, um, just, the, just the wildflowers. And bees, yeah, so there you go. I actually missed Becky's question. Uh, hey, Becky. Um, uh, do you, what do you recommend for a mulch applicator? Um, well, I mean, it, it's a, like a standard plastic mulch applicator that they would use for um, like, like some more like organic growers use for vegetable production or something like that. You plant uh, uh, plugs into it. Um, what we've used in the past is the PFRA uh, used to uh, provide, uh, a, um, or I think, I think this came from the paper. I'm not sure the story, but counties ended up getting a lot of, of, of mulch applicators across the land and they're still in operation and there's better ones and worse ones. Uh, the one we use in, in Flagstaff County is actually pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, you, you wanna, there's some d design features about it. You wanna make sure it has furrows to, to the, the edge of the plastic burrows in and stuff like that. Um, and, but it's always kind of a process to like get it right for your site. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's the that's the idea there. Um, um, Rob has a, has a good question. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I I I would I guess to follow up there, Becky. Just um, yeah, if if if, if uh, I know you're in Northern Sunrise County, there. If if, if they don't have one, I mean, uh, I think Grand Prairie County does. If there's ways of sharing it and or um, I, I, uh, like looking for um, organic uh, production um, mulch applicators for vegetables or something like that for vegetable production, and it should be the same. These are 1,500 meter, 1,500 foot long rolls. And they'll they'll fit uh, hopefully on the on the on the back of, of something like that. Um, 
Uh, Rob asks, will native grass outcompete the flowers over a few years? Um, it's a good question. Um, and uh, yeah, like, you know, in, in when, when based on what I, the experiments we've done with uh, seeding in uh, native wildflower meadows, we've focused on a 25% grass to 75% uh, wildflower mix. Um, so we're really trying to get those the flowers and hopefully they take up three quarters of this of the sort of the space they they um, They are uh, Bunch grasses are important. They provide a bit of structure for like bumblebees and other things to nest under so we don't yeah, they're even if they aren't used by pollinators for food. They're still helpful um, uh, and um, that, that that's that is a good question. Will they outcompete? compete? Um, I know I think in the prairies they, they might over a long period of time and uh, I know that uh, perhaps integrating livestock in that favor grasses at the right times of the year can help manage that. I know they've done experiments where they've and they've basically worked with uh, native prairie in, in the states and done uh, patch burn grazing where they graze area or burn areas then the grass shoots come up and then the, the, the bison or cattle will graze down on it and that'll result in an explosion of diversity of flowers uh, and, uh, and, and that's a really effective way of, of maintaining flower diversity. Of course, burning is not always practical, but um, yeah, that's, that, that is an option. And, and maybe Grant also has an idea of, 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 of managing this in, in a different way. Um, but yeah, for, for now, we, we've done our, our, our plantings. They're a few years old and um, so far the, the flowers are holding, holding their own, but uh, it could change over the future. Great. Um, I think that's all of our questions for Luke. Um, so maybe I'll just try the Alice presentation one, <laughs> one more time. Um, thanks so much, Luke. That was um, a lot of really useful information. I know I was taking notes like mad. So <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, Alice Canada is a national nonprofit program that encourages and supports sustainable agriculture by promoting beneficial management practices and the implementation of on the ground projects which protect and restore natural areas such as wetlands, grasslands, um, riparian areas, so, um, stream banks and tree areas. The outcome of these projects may include, but are not limited to, habitat for fish and wildlife, species at risk, um, native pollinator insects, cleaner air and water, and sustainable food production on working landscapes. Alice Wheatland and Alice Rocky View, and many others in Alberta, offer this community-led farmer-driven program for producers that pays for management and maintenance of ecosystem services on marginal farmlands. Um, project establishment and annual per acre funding for a five-year term for these types of projects are available um, from the Alice communities. And you can see here, we have one of our Alice projects in the background. Next. Um, so the ALICE program will partner on a wide range of projects, um, including pollinator projects, native prairie establishment, and eco buffers. And the rates on the screen are just an example of how different types of projects are funded in Meatland County, although these will differ from one community to another. Um, we put together this fact sheet um, just to help producers who are thinking about doing a pollinator project. And just to give a starting point, there's some um, tame agronomic species that we've included, as well as some, some native species with a focus on um, using these projects for pollinators as well as for grazing. And we're going to email out this fact sheet following the workshop.
So both Rocky View and Meatland counties are looking for landowners to partner with um, in 2021. These projects uh, have to be on agricultural land. And if you want to discuss a project, contact uh, your local ALICE coordinator or go to the ALICE Canada website to see if there's an ALICE program in, you, in your municipality and for uh, local contact information. So that's just a super quick intro to the ALICE program. Um, you can send me an email after if you have any quick questions I can answer them right now. Okay. Leave that up for now. Uh, I don't see any questions. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, Grant Lestuka. Grant's going to be talking about um, establishing pollinator habitat from seed um, and managing for pollinators and ecosystem health. Grant has worked in, the, as a, in forage and grazing extension for over 30 years. He and his wife, Della, and two daughters run a small, holistically managed grazing operation near Innisfil, Alberta. Here, he gets to practice what he learns and gets to make his own mistakes first and to learn from the mistakes that he makes firsthand. So with that, I'll pass it over to Grant. We'll stop sharing. Okay, I'm going to be uh, speaking. It's an area that has been near and dear to my heart for many years, and it started with my father, who passed away at 98, 10 years ago, but I've worked on, and as Luke, we're students, and still are students of all of this, because we really enjoy it, and Don Rizika, uh, who Luke had mentioned was a great mentor to us and teaching us many things. I've got to admit, as Don said to me, the mulch was a game changer. And we planted rows of trees and fruit trees and such, and we know the mulch saved a lot of trees and a lot of work to add more trees to the system as Don added thousands upon thousands it is a breakthrough because it helps the plants compete so well. Our initial plantings did not have the mulch and it was a lot of maintenance work and we lost a lot of trees simply from weed encroachment, uh, rotivating too deep around them. Uh, be careful about that, I'll tell you. And if you're using any of the mesh of any form, don't tuck it in down around the species, leave it in that square sitting out flat uh, so that you're not hampering roots because it's hampering things growing through it and you don't want your roots to have a problem growing through it. And I'm looking at this a little more holistically and I took the holistic management course, my wife and I did in 94, 95 people and learn from them and together. And there's a real opportunity to work with your Ellis program with Sarah and Laura and everybody. And do talk to your counties because the Ellis program is great, but unfortunately their transportation department doesn't follow Ellis as well as I would like to see. And that's a real dig, I guess, as I watch uh, roads uh, for snow removal and other things, concerns having shelter belts taken down and other things. So again, sorry, Sarah, for saying this so bluntly. So we're looking at this area and we're realizing, and as Luke brought forward some of his work, um, I'll talk a little bit about how it's all tied together. So I'm also looking at sequencing. And so sequencing so that we've got our species present but we've got also an array of species presence. The ecosystem that we look at, in my way of thinking, build it and they will come, as Luke said, and is so true. And that's something I think that we've watched with Don Rizika and others in our many ways of doing things that in fact are really helpful. And that is the point. We're looking at managing components as they come together to become in fact, a whole, whoops. We know we've got native species that are present around 
around. And depending on where you're calling in from, where you're attending this webinar, you know, we've got an array. And when we look at Mother Nature, we can see flowered meadows and think of the opportunities. We get out into the tough prairies where it's so dry and harsh, and we've got other species. And that is very true of these. We look at the areas that are a little more moisture and such, and we've got the yarrow that's present. When we start looking around the landscape, realizing what we've got, and Luke had shared some of this, we're looking at the different flowered broadleaf plants generally. So when you notice the flowers, as Luke had said, with the colors and such to attract bees to them, they tend to be the pollinators. It's surprising though that there are more pollinators than we think at times uh, for different purposes and more pollination plants as we think. And of course, some of the natives that we find that are really good. And then I threw in what you can do in your own backyard with a flowering plum or a mock orange in very early spring. Some real opportunities there to assist and trying just to help more bees, different bees, different pollinators beyond bees in their process and enhancing their livelihood and the work they've got in front of them um, so that they're going to be more prolific. This was work and those of you from uh, the Calgary area, Dr. Paul uh, uh, Galpern is doing some neat things and as Luke was talking about and he had a little video on this but he was kind enough to let me just share this but we find that there is more than you think and as holistically as ecosystems go the this this sharing the synergy of systems and that's what I look at with plant species being planted and others is synergy so how can we do things how can we manage things and yes there's some real possibilities in landscapes that aren't very productive and that is the point that Dr. Galperin quickly brought forward is that we can take those areas that are costing us money and if we've got an Ellis program, if we've got an excitement about doing something, lo and behold, we can build this and they will come. So there's more things we can do on the landscape and in so doing, enhancing the areas around it as well. And so those are some of the things I worry about as I watch so many of the shelter belts that are old or the tree side roadsides getting taken down uh, for the sake of snow removal we're managing and we need to be managing for uh, an ecological system, for a holistic system, and realizing it's exciting we got science from Dr. Gelprin to show that yes, it does matter, it does make a difference. And here I'm sharing a little bit about ours and what is local to me. I'm very spoiled, I've got the Innisfil natural area that is half a mile from me, and so it has got a lot of treed shelter there. And the neighboring farmer just went and took down all of his bush on that adjacent land uh, last year, much to my dismay. This is part of our landscape. And as you can see, this is a half a mile from that natural center. And we've also enhanced what was planted by planting a number of fruit trees, lots of choke cherries and pin cherries and Saskatoons, currants and such on the inside of this aspen and the thing we forget is aspen and willow in spring can be great foodstuffs for the bees for the insects that are pollinators and as we look across our landscape and this didn't show up as well as it should have but of course this is off of our place you can see the canada thistle so yes it's a weed i know but it is one of those other pollinators and we're so lucky as you can look at this landscape and see there are areas that have been left so that connectedness is crucial. So more at times than species, uh, thickness, density is connectedness too. So it's a little more complex and somebody uh, like Luke can help you with the, uh, the Woodlot Association and others in agroforestry. And that is something that a mixture of species, a mixture of connectedness to get out on that landscape um, so that in fact, we're making something that is going to work. I look at uh, people will say uh, symptoms of a problem in the holistic management world or a problem. 
And when I see things like this little fawn that I took a picture of in our forage land, that's orchard grass, by the way, you know that we're probably doing something right and maybe doing something too right because this is just a few of the 40 deer I counted. Or this is the other one where they're waiting with the cows to be fed. So that's a little too much. You can imagine how scary it is when you're walking through a field and you feel like something's watching you and it's five in the morning and you're thinking, what is it? Is it a cougar up a tree or what? And you look up and it's a bunch of these little owls watching you like hawks as you want to call it almost. But those are the signs that your landscape's working for you, I believe for pollinators as well. And I think that's important from my standpoint. One of the things that's a great early feeder is dandelions. And we've got honeybees on our place. And I know they say they've quit feeding sugars to the bees when in fact the dandelions come out. So that early spring bee sure enjoys those dandelions at the same time as that early spring occurs with dandelions. We're looking at the pussy willows as they start to fuzz. And, uh, also looking at the other perennials that are around them, the aspen and poplar. And then as the summer goes, uh, unfortunately, even some of the weeds do a good job. But you can see on this headland, that's our fruit tree row we've got. Um, we've got uh, uh, legumes in here, but the dandelion time is past. And in this case, we've got the fruit trees as well. So where is their time for flowering? I do encourage people as we look at things like I think a number of people first heard more about pollinators through the Cheerios campaign and such and looking at some really good ideas in conservation on your farm looking at some of these pollinator potential species that could be present and some good thoughts on it is that it is important to make sure they are not noxious weeds. Um, at times when they're coming from other places, it is really careful. And, and then that is why Luke shared with you that connectedness to look at what do you put. And I don't want it to be a Pennsylvania ecotype. I don't want it to be a noxious weed. I encourage you to look at what we've got available in our own systems. And there are are seed mixes out there that are in wildflowers and such. And the idea behind a lot of that is look at what is there, look at the species that are there, determine which ones in fact fit in your area. Are they annuals, biannuals, perennials? And as we're putting those species mixes together, if we're planting species, be cognizant of the fact, because I am out trying to control one of my flowers I planted that was not a native and should not have been planted as it spreads out through a field. And that is certainly something to watch for. So um, that, all those pieces to keep an eye on. Now, one of the other things as we look at our cropping systems, so I don't have as much on some of those shrubs I left that and uh, the fruit trees to uh, Luke to cover, but I start looking at the cropping end of things and realizing there's a great movement now for cocktail cover crops. And the beauty of cocktail cover crops is they're meant to be holistic. They're meant, to, but you gotta be careful because they're other people's mix is not yours. But why would you wanna plant them as part of it? So when we start looking at some of these mixes that potentially can flower, flower at different times, assist, with soil improvement. This is where some of this I think fits into other systems of cropland. And the species that are more in the center here tend to be the species that are in fact going to be more pollinator friendly species, ones with flowers on them and such. But we have to look at it carefully because also this chart shares warm the, so this is a cocktail cover crop chart. It is not a pollinator chart, but it has pollinators in there. And warm season species simply need, they need warm conditions. And if you're planting it in a place that is on a northern slope behind a set of trees, um, in a cooler climate uh, versus in a hot warm area where so much of the US, this comes out of the US in fact, 
some of these are growing here and planting here and doing fairly well. But at the same time, be careful because the warm seasons tend to be really requiring heat and they aren't something I quickly recommend to people. The key thing I think is the SARE group out of the U US does a good job in supporting agriculture and looking at research and extension. And the, the thought about it too is trying to manage crops profitably. And this is a little tangent again, I'm gonna go off on because in my own way of thinking, this can increase profit margins, but information to make good advice. So let where to from here, try to pick and look at your, your species you're choosing for the pollinator component, but also for the functional component. Because at times you'll see that, no, it doesn't work for pollinators, but it might work well for soil structure and for soil organisms. Then we get into the root crops, where in fact these root crops can address pollinators often. The warm species do again. So again, we're looking at what is present, what they can do, giving double duty to some of these species. So holistically, we're also approaching it from a standpoint of meeting more than one need and with so doing, hopefully amending landscape, improving soil, improving the food system that we've got and we're so proud of in this province and the ecological goods and services with an ecosystem. Because when we're managing, it's above ground, it's sunlight energy capture that is something that we're banking in the soil, we're banking for soil organisms, and as a pollinator, it's also going to impact that positively, potentially or negatively. So I try to look at things from a, a crop side, a plant side, in light of it serving that multifunctional needs. And I know this is kind of getting a little confusing and I'm afraid as a manager, you do have to wear more than one hat. And as I met this young fellow up at Manning many years ago, here's a young person, young family trying to be uh, a good ecological manager, but trying to improve his landscape, his soil, so he can be also profitable maintaining another generation taking over the landscape and in so doing that's the point I'm getting to is that annual crops do have potential when chosen right to be excellent pollinator investments and opportunities and at the same time profit generators and so let's try to for that double duty. Some of these cocktail covers a warm season and a cool season, cool season, cool season. We've got different species out there, ones that can amend the soil compaction, get down through the soil and help in areas around those areas where water is ponding on land for crop growers and other areas where we're looking at probably adding a lot more of that warm season benefit, particularly to pollinators and a higher quality feed stuff for an animal to eat. When we get into Phacelia that bees love, it's not a very good food stuff for animals, but having it in mixture services a purpose and seeding the whole mixture to that could well serve a purpose if it was part of a landscape that wasn't meant to be a profit generating one. So as I look at pollinators, I'm always trying to think through, can I help the grain farmer neighbor? Can I seed it in those areas around wetlands? And these don't grow well in wetlands, but around them, they can really make a difference to the whole. And that's the point. The water infiltration goes down greater and deeper and faster. And with hope of this, some of that landscape becomes a pollinator friend at a short period of time though. And that's where we're going with some of this. We have other crops like field peas that are known and are a crop that are grown in many parts of the province or lentils. And the hairy vetch is a cocktail cover that's a legume, both are legumes here. So they're fixing nitrogen. And as they fix nitrogen, it's also improving the soil and at the same time, creating more profitability for a landowner. The sunflowers, of course, are beautiful for the sake of a crop. 
they're also great for pollination. But again, a short season window of time. And as Luke had shared with you, we're looking at that strength and saying, okay, I can see where they'll fit very well in the system for that window. And so how can I put that window together? And putting that window together in a mixture, in a cover crop, could well mean different flowering times. And that is exactly the point. We can put it together for different flowering times and different pollinator foodstuff times. So let's not just feed them really well for one week. Let's try to feed them for more time so that the array of pollinators, the habitat for different pollinators is present for longer. And by so doing, keeping more species productive and healthy and vigorous in the landscape. And as we can see on this buffer area, this person has planted willows and such and kept the fenced out from livestock even. So the manner of planting pulses here with peas and willows. So we got an early spring, possibly plant for uh, pollination. We've got a later season plant for pollination. Once we start looking at legumes and flowers that are flowering legumes that are consumable by livestock and really do well, uh, we've got to remember that the benefits they give to pollinators is great, but also to watch for what they are. These are all perennial species in other countries. When brought to Canada, they are annual species. And what happens with an annual species, and I don't have this done so well, and thank you to Graham Finn for giving this to me. Within eight weeks of life, that's a root system on a pea. Within eight weeks of life, hardly seen here, is a root system on crimson clover. So if you can see, I'm trying to protect the soil, trying to grow fiber, trying to prevent erosion, trying to add nitrogen to the soil. I'm looking for a more holistic system. I'm much better off with the pea than I am with this. But it doesn't mean I won't grow this. It just means I understand where its strengths lie. And looking at Canadian data, Canadian results, and realizing that the fastest results, the most successful results I'm going to have in flowering and growing, meeting the soil needs and nitrogen needs for other crops even with it. So again, looking at a Canadian or a, an annual here versus a perennial that is not a perennial here. One of the dilemmas I have, and this is a pollinator mix that's seeded, and this pollinator mix I'm making a point because it starts the year, it starts to grow in the year, and six weeks later, this is what is there in the year. So you see the point. The point is to these mixtures that once we start, it's going to take time and growth. And with growth, we've got many times where the land is bare where the pollinators aren't benefiting until a certain time. And that comes back down to that question, how dense do I plant? My comment is, that's part of it. But what do I plant is the, another big part. And thank you to Nora Paulovich for this one, because now I'm leading you into perennials. And perennials that are in grasslands usually, doesn't mean they have to be. But the idea behind that is this is a beautiful picture, but it also is in my own mind, a door of opportunity. As we look at this door of opportunity, we realize that we've got perennials that can in fact flower and be part of healthy grazing systems with integrating livestock on landscape. And integrating livestock on landscape simply means there's greater opportunities for a longer window of flowering, a longer managed protection of soil. So holistically, we're looking at a landscape where soil is protected. We tend to have more species that are pollinators in them. In fact, can have significantly so if managed right. And yes, as the question had came, grasses are wind pollinated. So they're not as attractive as you can see to uh, a bee or another insect. 
So, so often we're looking for the flowering plants to be the ones with the most nectar and pollen. As I look across landscapes, I'm looking for opportunities. And as I look for opportunities, I'm trying to understand what the potential could be for them. And this is one of our pastures that we have. And of course, it's got a lot of tame species coming in. And my wife, who doesn't want her picture taken, as you can see, but uh, we're looking at a lot of the tame legumes that have snuck in here over time. And the point of the question of managing, I can manage for keeping them or losing them, depending on how I graze. And that is the other thing, species, but management of species is what we're bringing out. If I manage the stand as I have with one grazing a year, making that a properly timed grazing, I can allow for a lot of habitat for a pollinator, a lot of plants for pollinators on this landscape, because the animals are going to come here at a time that allows for these species to prosper, be productive for pollinators. And this is another part of the paddock. And as you can see, with long rest periods between grazing incidents, these are purple pea vine, which is a native vetch, a legume, and it grows in clusters, as you can see. And also another flowering one that is a poisonous one to animals, water hemlock and uh, I'm not telling you you should graze this but I do and if it's managed carefully and holistically this is very dangerous so I'm not encouraging anybody to do this but it is a native pollinator species as well and so a longer rest allows for this on landscape health and also in varying environments it always excites me. This is the first one that comes in the spring for me as I find near bushland and such. And I'll pick these flowers for my wife. So for those of you that want to work out with your uh, pollinator plants and yet have a great relationship at home, I encourage you to maintain these species and select them. Again, another early species in the spring. All three of these are very early in the spring. So they're all native, by the way. So the, the beauty of management, the beauty of timing, the beauty of location, what is possible, what's potential. And the three flowered avens doesn't like as much waterlogged soil. The Solomon seal can take a lot more as can the, the bluebell. When I'm on this area, that's when I'm picking my wife, my bluebells, my tall bluebells for her. I'm not picking the dandelions, but the dandelions are a key part of all of this. What I wanted to say is management. And I can't do a great job with pollinator habitat when it isn't allowed to be done. And to me, so much of management requires an understanding, not just of what is a pollinator, but how I can manage for the services to be provided in more entirety. I know that in the shoulder of the road, I could have some uh, sweet clover areas. I could have some alfalfa areas, but in my managed landscape, I don't have that. So I challenged people at times, and actually it wasn't me, it was Doug Ray. And there he's standing with a pollinator plant that's a sandfoin, actually. And he's saying to people, you know, if you seeded a pasture, again, if you seeded a pollinator species, what would it look like? But at the same time, if you manage for it, and just as I found with those shelter belt tree rows, the breakthrough, as Don Rizika said, of that matting is huge because now it allows for us to succeed at a higher level, a greater level, and be able to put down more and succeed with more and manage more. And yet at the same time in a pasture, my challenge with you would be economically, I could show you, you would have more as well. We have a lot of legumes in pastures that all fit the pollinator bill. And with all of those legumes, many choices and adaptabilities, and where does this fit in pollinator landscapes? Is it in fact just an area we choose to seed and not use animals on? Most certainly you can. Or is it an area you choose to seed and have animals on? Have your cake and eat it too.
And my challenge to you is I find almost in all areas of the province, when these plants are managed wisely, they have a wide pollinator window that goes for a long time. And if managed unwisely, they have a very short pollinator window and a short life even. But the pot potential for managing them once they're established is a key. And that is something to consider. All of these are legumes that fix their own nitrogen. All of them are productive and healthy species for animals to eat. Goodness knows these two even are deworming plants for sheep, goats, cattle, as is this because of the tannins and non-bloating, by the way, these bloat. So anyway, possibilities. So the challenge I always throw at people in grazing courses that I've taught is never manage with your eyes closed. And you're managing always with monitoring and controlling. As you manage with monitoring and controlling, you're also looking at the possibilities of uh, doing different things to manipulate it. And this is what Luke had said maybe that I'd talk about. I manage holistically. I try to presume I'm going to be wrong. Therefore, I try not to do the same thing in the same way and leave the same results ever in a row. So just as two years are never the same, my management is never the same quite on that landscape. I'm doing it because I humbly know an ecosystem functions much more wisely than I do. How can I manage it with respect and yet have my cake and eat it too? The biggest thing I think is rest periods. So it is doing the best we can to have animals in one place and out of there. And sometimes this doesn't work, other times it does. So it is really important in my mind for the pollinators to give long breaks between. And it is so many of those pollinator species do start flowering then and flower and flower twice even. The key thing that has bothered me for a long time is people have so often said in research even, maintain a low stocking rate. That is really important. What they're sentencing me to is a life of low profit. And the fact of the matter is, I wanna be a steward. I wanna be a steward respectfully of this ecosystem, of this landscape. If you sentence me to a life where I can't pass it on to my children, I can't make a living doing it, my spouse or I both have to work off the farm to do it. I cannot afford this unless the land is so non able to give more. And in more times, I find it simply management. And I can get a much higher stocking rate, much higher profit. It's just management. And the biggest thing for me as a rule of thumb is I try to let plants recover in spring. I try to grow a big solar panel and only remove part of it in the spring, early part of the year, leaving a big solar panel to capture sunlight, to send it down to the roots of the plants, to allow for those legumes to maybe not be grazed in the earlier spring pass at all and bloom thereafter or rebloom. And in the second grazing over that might occur this summer, this fall, next spring, I am in fact taking another one. And so doing, I'm challenging plants. Oh, we seem to have lost you, Grant. All right, just give us a second here, guys. We'll find out what's going on. In the meantime, I can just jump in here. Um... I, I I wanted to look up Noah's question because it was bothering me. Um, so I'll just fill the time by ans answering as best I can. Um, uh, I, the fact sheets that I mentioned, including this one, the Xerxes Society fact sheet, establishing pollinator mouse for feed, they recommend 40 to 60 uh, seeds per square foot for native uh, wildflowers. 
or that's 20, 25% grass is 75% wildflowers. And, um, and uh, also based on other things. So, so, so yeah, that, it's, it's a seed thing. It's not, it's hard to do a weight thing because there's so much diversity of seed weights for the different flowers. This is like a, a totally like we're, we're learning as we go. Reclamation does not use wildflowers a lot in the past. Um, and so like, there's still a lot of work to be done to learn how to do this on scale. I've done it on pretty small scales yet. Um, but I know like the uh, Agriculture Canada is doing some, some research on, on seeding uh, native uh, wildflowers. And um, there's other companies around Alberta and, and we are too, we're, we're working on it. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, the seeding rate of, you wanna get 50 seeds per square foot. Um, and then apparently according to what I've read, what a year in, you have a, a density of, uh, like I guess a three uh, uh, um, seedlings per, per per square foot. Uh, that's that's looks good. Um, uh, then then you have at least if you have at least that, then you're 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 okay for establishment of a stand. So hopefully that answers your question uh, a little bit. But um, basically we're we're learning a lot, and this has only been mostly done on, on smaller scales, at least with like pure native wildflowers. Um, like agronomic species is a different story. So. I'm back. Thank you, Sonia. Okay. All right. If you can see me and hear me, thank God. Uh, sorry about this. Um, I manage for leaving residual and grazing, but Luke has a point there when he was talking to you about this is the spring management. We're really managing just to use stress or challenge plants so that my pollinators are going to be the best they can be. They're hiding in here in different ways. This stand doesn't have the pollinator in it, but it's sharing the example. The point of all that is that I'm setting the grasses back for the perennial pollinators to come on. And why I'm doing that and can manipulate that system and have done it failing and succeeding at the same time uh, allows for those of you who do graze animals to realize you can too. And when things get away on you, you can manipulate the system to really set back plants or to energize them. And that's exactly what I'm doing here with mine. So you can bring on these legumes and you can see this flowering one. This is October 1st and we still have the odd flower appearing in this legume stand. So if we're talking about a long season of pollinators and depending on the heat and cold, I know the pollinators might not be functioning, but you're still looking at trying to showcase because it was set back in July with regrowth from July, you have a situation where you in fact getting this to come on and with it coming on September 4th, as an example here of this little friendly honeybee, uh, or in my apologies, it's not a honeybee, I think it's a bumblebee on the sand foin. And this is again a bumblebee on the red clover. So I'm managing, as I've got maturity, I'm still managing for some of these to be in fact pollinator foodstuffs. And this is September 4th, and it's last fall at our place on Elsite Clover. And so you can see that I'm really armed and dangerous because at times it does work for me and other times it doesn't. But last fall was an example of how you could. And this whole area was in fact grazed in uh, late June. And then you can see on that September 4th day, I was running around taking pictures. So that's why I was so excited when Sarah and Laura asked me if I can do a pollinator talk because I'd known that I'd been capturing these pictures. And the point is we can manage for maturity, but immaturity within itself with proper grazing management, with higher stocking densities for profit as well on the landscape. Bird's foot trefoil, and then we're looking red clover, and this was all the same day I was shooting it, and the white clover plant in between. So when somebody says, how far do we plant things? I let mother nature decide at times, but I let my management set the stage. And that is an important one. Let your management set the stage. Some people say, why do you have red clover? It only lives for two years. 
Well, 25 years ago, it was, it was there and it's still there now. When you manage for pollination and seed set, as you saw in this other one, you're in fact allowing for lifetimes uh, and not having to cultivate, keeping that landscape for the pollinators, the ability to burrow in the soil to come back and be a strong possibility for later. On July 28th, look at this beautiful pollinator field of Elsike and red clover. And this is a low area on our place, beside the moose pasture, we call it. But on October 23rd, I went in there and put the cattle to graze it. And when they went in there and grazed it, of course, they're grazing a lot of mature seed stuffs. And the following June, so that was set the stage of a year ago, the following June, you can see these baby guys coming in the middle of this. And if you look really closely, as I've zeroed in on it, this is red clover, <clears throat> and these have hairs on them. So therefore, I know they're red clover seedlings. They're not white clover. So it is true that the animals have spread it through manure. So I am maintaining my own pollinator habitats. I'm stretching out the length of time. Those are willows, those are aspen and poplar. And I've got my dirty, my messy fields. I've got corridors, I've got areas around to support all this, but I'm also managing for it and I'm managed with profit too. And as I look at the stand, this is a manipulation I'm showing you happening. On May 24th, the grasses were getting above my pollinator plants. I saw this and the dilemma that happens with this is that they now are going to be challenged. They're not going to be great pollinators. By June 1st, the grass, the meadow brome, is getting ahead of them. It's starting to flower. Now the cattle aren't going to graze it first. If you put them in the stand, they're going to graze the grass first. I needed to be out there earlier, back the picture I showed you with residual. You can see this cow grazing on June 10th. She is not grazing the mature grasses. She's grazing the tops off the pollinators that haven't flowered. So she's removing the pollinator habitat, unfortunately, because of my mismanagement. And you can see in this area, I didn't get my stocking rate. I didn't get my pollinators. So I've lost a lot because of management. So I can manipulate with grazing to allow for that pollinator habitat. This is the same land the year later, last year. So on this landscape, that was the one, and you can see all the flowering plants. I had to go out and graze this stand before the three leaf stage in spring. And without the three leaf stage in spring, I have got a hardship placed in fact, on the grasses. Well, if I put a hardship on the grasses, I've manipulated it so the pollinators can take over again. So I manipulated the situation to allow for pollinator habitat to come back for me. And so, yes, it is management. It's not just species of pollinators. It's management of pollinators. It's management for the success of establishing and maintaining them. Just as we talked about the shrubs and the importance of weed competition by using the mulches and such, we also talk about grazing management ma needs and management of that. And when we do that, we have got a July 4th pollinator habitat, July 4th. And so with this uh, uh, July 28th pollinator habitat, so I'm making these perennials work through the summer for me. An August 24th pollinator habitat, September 4th pollinator habitat. And here I've got seed set of the cura clover on September 4th from the mature plants that were present. And so it's guaranteeing a stand that's going to have more species over time and maintaining it. We also do different things like we'll add to stands by feeding some of these legume seeds to animals. And, uh, and that was what was coming on November 13th at our place out of a little cow pie. So these are plants that are known for pollination sandfoins because of indeterminate growth, flowering, seed setting on the same plant. Bees love the sandfoin as they do several plants that are really great pollinators like Phacelia. 
but trying to increase the generation of their lives. The thing I'm going to throw at you, just as I complained about a little bit about our transportation departments and counties, how many of us are out there nicely mowing down our driveways so it looks so beautiful? How many of us think that that is beautiful? Here's our driveway. And I've got June 15th pollinator habitat, June 15th of clovers, June 15th of alfalfa pollinator habitat. Well, I went out and with that habitat, I had in fact grazed it right after this. So the cattle went out and grazed it right after this. And the second time they grazed this habitat was October 20th. Important to do so, I'll tell you, because the snow catches and it blocks the road if you don't for winter. So instead of my mower, here's my mower. And I've had all this pollination. So it's for those people that are looking at agriculture and I want you to look in the mirror yourselves. Because if you've got a set of horses, are you managing with controlled grazing for pollinator habitat with your horses? Are you managing your laneways and driveways for pollinator habitat? Or are you expecting somebody else to do it for you? I challenge you to look at your own self too and also take advantage of some of these opportunities because certainly they are there more than we think. And the importance in so much of that is to me is so crucial because we know that when we integrate a steward here, and this is my wife again, she doesn't like her picture taken, but when we have a steward there managing and caring and integrating, a hawk post here, so we're looking at that holistically. We are integrating livestock to create a profit. This is a laneway, by the way. Doesn't look like a laneway, does it? Well, we manage for long rests for pollinators, and I didn't show the yellow blossom alfalfa or the legumes that are in another two pictures that are part of this laneway. So a laneway that could be used all winter for cattle, but come summertime, we let the plants develop. We let the steward in stewardship manage for success because this is my fear, and this is my last slide. Without that wind changed almost immediately, the cows disappeared, and you can't see my wife hardly here at all. But the fact is the steward, if they're out, if we lose the steward in stewardship, we're also losing that ability to truly manage landscapes for food production, manage landscapes also for pollinators, for ecosystem services. So I'm going to end my presentation there. And thank you so much for everything. I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks so much, Grant. Um, as always, you are so knowledgeable. Um, I really like your idea of using the laneways as pollinator habitat. Um, just I don't see any questions out there, but um, if you have any questions about um, any specific species or managing specific species, feel free to ask. I'm just going to leave it out there for a minute. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have a question, Grant, um, when it comes to establishing a uh, standpoint. Do you have to do anything different than you would for an alfalfa crop? Every, every species has its, its needs and that's part of the understanding that we look at them in light of that. And you've done a nice job in putting together information on this pollinator projects so that we know some of the characteristics and grazing management opportunities there. And that is one of the places I guess I look at in collecting information. No, Sanfoin does not like wet feet. It, like alfalfa, does very well on uplands and drier areas and such. Um, we know that the new Sanfoin cultivars regrow better than the old ones generally. Sanfoin isn't the answer to everyone at all. It's just one of those species that does have uh, a, a very pollinator friendly and unfortunately I'll say deer friendly mm -hmm. and it does bring in all those deer and in early spring they are grazing my sanfoin 
um, because it is an early growing plant. It's an early flowering plant. And that's one of the reasons we like it for pollinators because it's got a long flowering window of time, especially with management and the newer cultivars. But um, in lower areas, the birds for trefoil would be a choice or the Elsite clover. Um, but with any legumes, it's a question of bunch grasses with them. So they're a little less competitive potentially as you are thinking about, I think Sarah, and you're directing my, what I think is important. And so a little less competi competition against them, um, but also management on top of that and establishing into existing stands is something that a lot of people look to do. And um, yes, yeah, sandfoin is a reseeder in itself, as is birds for trefoil, both set seed very well above ground and everything. Um, but we're also looking at um, knowing we need windows of time for that to become a success. The other thing is to watch a little bit. I think that uh, the town of Innisfail really doesn't like birds for trefo. The town of Cochrane really doesn't like sice or milk vetch. They are seed setters and spreaders, and they do spread on landscapes a bit. And mowing along the highways also spreads them. So some of these do spread and cognizant of native, cognizant of uh, a weed is a, a plant where you don't want it. Um, where I want it as a pollinator, um, the town of Venezuela maybe doesn't want it as uh, the the flower. Uh, Birds of Truffle is the flower of Venezuela, by the way. Great, great, thanks, Grant. We actually just have a, um, a couple more questions. Um, Jamie wants to know if you have any experience on grazing wild parsnip. A wild parsnip, I don't think many graze it. Um, there's water hemlock, water parsnip, cow parsnip. So depending on which species we're talking about, be very careful here because a water hemlock is very, very poisonous. Water parsnip is not, but people think it is. But the reality is knowing both is important. Um, uh, the, the cow parsnip is a plant that I don't know if goats will graze, but I don't know what would graze, maybe, maybe goats, but it is a plant that I, I really don't, I know enough because I've got it, but it isn't part, it's part of our fenced out tree areas. So it's part of our area that we call our beaver pond. Um, and so it grows in the non-grazed areas. Um, and I can't say as I know what grazes them, sorry. Perfect. Um, and then Brenda had, was wondering if you had any advice, I'm assuming for managing um, leafy spurge. I don't know if you the, know okay. Um, the sheep really like leafy spurge and it's one of the things I know that has been used at the Waldron ranches. Uh, Laura and Sonia have had many people from Foothills out to see and they use a shepherd and a local flock and now you can't even hardly find the leafy spurge because and I know in some river systems and other places so the the sheep is one that is very good on leafy spurge and the sheep industry is growing uh, I know there's uh, some tremendous prices being paid in that area and I'd encourage young people if they were looking at ruminants uh, to certainly look at those type of livestock between sheep and goats. And yes, they uh, do eat leafy spurge very well. Perfect. Um, and then you can also contact your local agriculture department. Um, they might have some suggestions or tools. Um, that can help you control the leafy spurge. Okay, so I think that's all of our questions. Oh, no, um, sorry, there's, there's one in the chat about phacelia. Oh, I missed that. Um, it just asking if it reseeds and if it's invasive. To my understanding, it is not a perennial here. It is an annual. It, uh, I've not heard of it reseeding at all. And with that in mind, it's the best of my knowledge, no. And uh, beyond that, um, uh, double check with somebody else if you're uh, asking that. 
Um, and depending on which environment you're in, I don't know where Facelia reseeds and does well. Uh, unfortunately, coming as an invasive plant, my understanding is not. Great. Good. Um, well, thank you to all the attendees today for taking the time out of your day to learn more about our pollinators and projects that we can do to help support them. Uh, please feel free to reach out to your local county agricultural department or um, Alice coordinator or Oz or the Foothills Forage and Grazing Association if you have any further questions. We'll be sending out the link to the recording as well as the pollinator fact sheet. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lou. Thank you so much. <laughs> so sorry, you guys, again. No, it wasn't too bad this time, Grant. Just a little blip. And uh, thank you both very much for presenting. So. Thank you. Oh, I love Luke's. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think it's a lot of fun and lots of Ellis projects and more uh, win-wins, huge win-wins. In uh, And I can't wait till Luke gets his PhD and then we'll see what really will fly because I'm sure that uh, there'll be lots of exciting times ahead. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Grant. You take care. Yeah, take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, Grant. Bye, Lee. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.